from Trekaroo, and we are on our third virtual field trip. And as you can see, ooh, we have someone that just popped up. Oh, and she disappeared. But anyway, we are on our third virtual field trip. And we are kind of going to multiple places because we're going to be learning all about whales today. And as we all know, whales swim from faraway places to faraway places. So we need to go all over the place, all over the Pacific Ocean to go hang out with them. And if you look behind me in this photo, this is the Safari Endeavor? No, the Safari Voyager maybe. Mm. I think it's the Safari Voyager. And um, my son Zachary and I went on it um, last year in Costa Rica. So I wanted to show you that picture. And that is the kind of ship that Uncruise takes to bring us to look for whales. And today we have with us Jessica Pasinich, and she is going to introduce herself and tell us what she does. Hello everyone, my name is Jessica. And just like Leeling said, I work aboard ships that look like the one that's right behind her. So they're small, they're really small ships. And I take folks just like all of you kids out on them for a week at a time. And we go to really special places. We'll go to Alaska for a week. So you'll live on board a ship like that for a week. Or we'll go to Hawaii or Costa Rica or Baja or the Pacific Northwest. And we're going and we're going into the wilderness in these places looking for critters. So looking for whales, bears, seals, sea lions, sharks, moose, anything your heart desires that lives in that area in the wild, the special places in our planet. So, but today you guys are here to hear about whales. So we have some favorites. Yes, I heard someone say that they had a narwhal was a favorite. Yes, is that your favorite? Do we have some other favorites? Sperm whale. Yes, that's my favorite. You as well? Beluga. Belugas. You said beluga. Yeah. So I said beluga. You said beluga? Yeah. What about you, Anthony? What's your favorite? Um, blue black whales. Ooh. Does anyone, has anyone ever seen a humpback whale? Yeah. Those are my favorites, and those are the guys we're going to be talking about today. Is that okay? Hey, what? What? Sperm whales and humpback whales. Sperm whales and favorites. humpback whales. Me too. Me too. Those are my two favorites. So in order to hang out with these whales, all of the ones that you guys just said, so narwhals, belugas, sperm whales, humpback whales, we have to go to some pretty wild places, which means we usually have to take an airplane, and in our case, we have to get on a boat and go out into the middle of nowhere. So we go to Hawaii to find these whales, we go to Baja to find these whales, we'll go to Alaska to find these whales, but all of those places have one thing in common. The whales are in the wilderness. So what does wilderness mean to you guys? It could be anywhere. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it could be anywhere. But one thing I'm going to tell you is that the wilderness is just for the animals and the trees and the plants and the rocks. There aren't many people there, which means there aren't many roads. There aren't buildings or houses or companies or fisheries or things like that. It's really in the middle of nowhere. So who's been someplace where they had to take a plane there? They couldn't drive there. How many of you? Oh my gosh, almost everybody? Almost everybody. Very well-traveled folks. Like what? We've been to like a thousand. You've been to a thousand places without roads? No. That's very lucky. That's fantastic. Those are the kinds of places that we go to on an uncruise adventure. So we're gonna talk about two places today. We're gonna talk about Alaska and Hawaii because that's where we find humpback whales. We're going to talk about two special places today, and those two special places are Southeast Alaska and the Hawaiian Islands out in the Pacific Ocean. We're talking about those places because those are the two favorite homes of humpback whales. So 
We see all sorts of wildlife out there in these places, but some of the folks' favorite critters to see, of course, are dolphins and whales. So, just some of the whales and dolphins that we see in Hawaii. These are Hawaiian spinner dolphins. We'll see bottlenose dolphins. Have you guys seen these guys before? These guys are really big. We'll also see these guys. These are pilot whales, short finned pilot whales, and they live out in the deep ocean blue about five miles off the Hawaiian coast. When we're in Alaska, we'll see these guys, these black and white porpoise. These are dolls porpoise. We'll see harbor porpoise, but the whale who everybody wants to see always is the humpback whale. And that's this guy right Yay. here. These are the special guys. These are the guys we see in both places. Has it, and you guys have all seen humpback whales, right? All of you, do you all know how to identify them? So we know these whales based on a few striking defining features. Number one, right? They're really big. How big? They're bigger than elephants. They're much bigger than you and I. They're about the size of a big giant school bus and just as heavy. Another identifying feature is they have really long pectoral fins. Look at that. Whoa. Look how long those fins are. They use those fins to spin through the water and to swim and to propel their bodies up out of the water. They also have really knobby chins. That's another way you can identify them. Knobby chins and knobby flippers. <laughs> have a very distinct tail. See all the white and black markings on the bottom of their tail? Each whale, every single one, has an individual tail just like your fingerprint. Just like the pad of your finger is different on each person, each one of you guys has a different fingerprint, each whale has a different pattern on the bottom of his tail. And their tails are called flukes. And they have one more really special feature. Look at that. That is a picture of a whale looking you in the face and his belly, his chin right there, is filled with water so it's blown up. They have these pleats, they're called ventral pleats, that allow their throats to expand and gulp down lots and lots of water. What are those little things growing on top of him? Barnacles. Ooh. You see those? Whales have tons of barnacles on them. They also have lice and all sorts of bacteria and little critters living in and on their skin. They shed a lot of that skin every single day. And if you follow a whale and it jumps up out of the water and breaches back down, if you go to where the water is disturbed, you'll see all their skin cells floating on the top of the water. Scientists like myself go around and collect those skin cells. and We do DNA tests on them to try and figure out clues about specific family groups. Sound like something you guys want to do? <laughs> collect whale skin? <laughs> <laughs> Did you say that they have lice on them? They have lice, yes. Lots of lice. They're entire ecosystems unto themselves. So they have all little, lots of teeny tiny little worlds. A lot of them you would need to see under a microscope. But if you take a little piece of dead whale skin and you put it under a microscope, you would see all sorts of teeny tiny critters living on that skin. So those are some of the features that we can use to identify a humpback whale. You know what these guys don't have though? Teeth. This type of whale doesn't have any teeth. Instead, they have a mouthful of hair and it's called baleen. You can see it in this photo here, or you can see it better right there. See all those little knobs all over his head? Those are those knobs I was telling you about, but inside his mouth is filled with the same substance that's on your head. This is keratin. Your hair is made of keratin. And those baleen are made of keratin too. Sounds pretty weird, huh? But it's because they don't need to chew anything. So humpback whales don't chew anything. Their favorite food is so small that they don't need to break it up with sharp teeth. 
Instead, they need help straining their food from the water, and that's just what these hares do. These humpbacks feed by taking enormous mouthfuls of seawater. Hopefully, it's got a lot of little fishes in it. See, look well, Anthony, at that. Anthony had a question, which is perfect for this, for this picture. Um, what's the pink thing that's on top of their um, mouth? Ooh, where? Right there? Yep. That, that. The um, thing that's in the middle. Yeah, that is the roof of his mouth. So that's, if you open your mouth really wide and you look at the top inside, you'll see a little line going up the top of your mouth. That's what that is. <laughs> Isn't that cool? How much water do you think they can scoop up in their mouth at one time? Uh, hundred gallons. Ooh, that's a great guess. Not quite though. It's as much as a swimming pool. They can fit a swimming pool's worth of water in that mouth at once. Uh. So hopefully, when they take a big gulp of water, they get a lot of little fishes in it. And then those pleats that we were talking about expand and they strain all the fish out of the water through the hairs, those baleen, expelling the water and keeping the fish behind. And then they swallow those fish down. It's sort of like boiling pasta. You know how you have little teeny tiny elbow pasta, like for macaroni and cheese? And then you take the hot water and the cooked pasta and you pour it over a colander and it lets the water drain out, but it keeps the pasta behind. That's what their mouths are doing. And then they swallow down the little fishes, which are like the pasta for our macaroni and cheese. Are you enjoying our virtual field trip? Be sure to click the like button or to subscribe so you know when our next field trip happens. So Bianca's question is, they are, are whales called filter feeders? Yes, these whales are filter feeders. Very good, excellent. There are some whales that have teeth. So who's seen an orca before? They're also called killer whales. They're the big black and white guys. Yeah, those whales have teeth. These whales have little hairs called baleen, which makes them a filter feeder. So are blue whales. There are lots of different whales out there that are filter feeders. And all of the filter feeders eat really small Um, they have very small little throats, about the size of a grapefruit, a humpback anyways. And so everything that they eat has to be able to fit down that throat. And so all their little favorite foods are tiny fatty fishes like herring and sand lance and capelin. So remember how I said earlier that at Uncruise we see humpbacks in Hawaii and Alaska? Are these places close by? No, no, they're not, right? They're really far away. They're really far apart. But we see the same whales in Hawaii and Alaska. So is this magic? What's happening here? Um, because, they still, because they swim long, long spaces. Yes, very good. That's excellent. They swim all the way from Alaska to Hawaii every year, and that's called migrating. It's one of the longest migrations of any mammal. So humpback whales live in all of our oceans all around the planet, every single ocean. That means that every ocean has a place where humpback whales go in the summertime, and then it has a place where humpback whales go in the wintertime. So with Uncruise, I get to hang out with the humpbacks who live in this area called the Gulf of Alaska. Right, let's see, outside of Juneau, um, in Glacier Bay National Park, a place called Icy Strait, Chatham Strait, all of these waterways are in Southeast Alaska. So the whales that I know personally, my friends and buddies, they live there in the summertime. And then in the wintertime, they travel 3,000 miles from Southeast Alaska all the way to Hawaii. Anybody know how far 3,000 miles is? 
It's all the way across the country. So if you got in your car and drove from San Francisco all the way to Washington, D.C., that's 3,000 miles. These humpback whales travel that distance twice a year. So in the springtime, they'll get together and they'll travel from Hawaii to the Gulf of Alaska. And then in the fall, they do the same thing and they go back to Hawaii. Now, let's see, they migrate back and forth, just like we're talking about. The question is why? Who knows why they do that? Why would they do that? That takes a really long time. It's, it takes them about two months, anywhere from four to eight weeks to make that trek. Looks like we have some people who have ideas about why they might want to do that. I see lots yes, of Yes, let's hear it. <laughs> yes. Go ahead, Anthony and Lucia. Um, because in some places, they um, stay there to eat and um, other places oh. they breed and also because of the different climates. <laughs> Bianca's saying that they want to migrate. Yes, they want to migrate and you hit it right on the head. Each place offers something that they need. So these whales, when they're in Alaska, need something very specific but they need something very different when they're in Hawaii. So when they're in Alaska, they're eating. They're eating every single day. They're eating 5,000 pounds of fish a day in Alaska. But while Alaska has lots of rich water that, that harbors all these fatty little fishes, it's the most delicious place to eat. There's one thing that Alaska doesn't have. What could that possibly be? What else do these whales need to do in order to live their life cycle that doesn't have to do with feed? Reading? Yes, good job, excellent. And Hawaii has warm, shallow water where they can communicate easily and they travel there to breed, to mate and breed, and to have their calves. They nurse those calves for the entire winter, and then they travel right back to Alaska to go and feed again. So it's eating food in Alaska, and then they make their families in Hawaii. And that's pretty important, right? Yeah, very, very important. So Southeast Alaska doesn't make a good nursery for baby humpbacks. The best nursery is in Hawaii because of the warm waters. Uh, it sounds pretty good to me. I'd love to go hang out in Hawaii for the, for the winters. And that's exactly what we do in, um, with Uncruise Adventures. We hang out in the summer with the whales in Alaska. And then we go and hang out in the winter with the Alaska, with the whales in Hawaii. And the first humpbacks to arrive, let's see. Ooh, here's where they go in Alaska. See Glacier Bay National Park right there in the middle? That's one of the places where we go to visit the whales. Who's been to Glacier Bay? Any of you guys been to Glacier Bay National Park? Not yet? Nope. It's on the list? That's a place where the humpbacks are very well taken care of. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But here in the Hawaiian Islands, there's another marine preserve. See in the middle of this picture here, in between Molokai, Lanai, and Maui? That's the National Marine Humpback Sanctuary. And in that area, the humpbacks are very well taken care of. They're protected. No one can fish. Obviously not fish for them. You can't harass them. You can't chase them. You can only watch them. And that's because they're there to give birth to their babies and to mate to nurse those babies so that the calves grow really strong to make the migration north, which is how long, guys? How many miles all the way back to Alaska? 3,000, right? The same distance as it is across the United States. So here is a humpback mom with her calf. We lovingly call these guys pickles. Don't the little babies look like little pickles, little dill pickles? That's a humpback calf with her mom. There they are again. See that light color? Their skin hasn't darkened. They get suntans just like me and you. When they're born, look how light they are. 
the melanin in their skin hasn't given them a suntan yet. So they need time to develop that suntan. It happens maybe after about three or four weeks and they turn a beautiful dark color just like their moms on the top. They're so cute. Aren't they beautiful? <laughs>
No. <laughs> that would be awful, right? But that's what these guys do. They don't eat. <laughs> That's why when they go back to Alaska, they need to eat 5,000 pounds of fish a day. to know how long those baby calves stay with the mothers? That's a great question. The baby calves will stay with their mothers for a year. So the mothers go down to Hawaii and they mate and then they travel back pregnant to Alaska. They'll feed for a season and the very and they'll stay pregnant for almost an entire year. They'll travel back down to Hawaii for the next season and that's where they'll give birth to that calf. They'll nurse that calf that entire winter in Hawaii and then together the mom and the baby stay together and the mom will teach that baby calf the route to get back to Hawaii. That calf will stay with the mom the entire time in Hawaii for that first year and then they probably part ways after that first year. Humpbacks don't necessarily live in family groups. They're not like orcas. Orcas live in family groups. But humpbacks come together in groups in Alaska and Hawaii for different reasons, but they're not necessarily related. They could be possibly, but it's not the rule. It would be the exception, not the rule. This, but if a whale who has never gone to Mexico has to return to Hawaii, how will they know which way is back home? That is an excellent question. And I love these good questions you guys are asking because we don't know. We don't know how the whales know where to go. So take your imaginations and go out into the middle of the Pacific Ocean for a minute. The Pacific Ocean is really deep. So the whales aren't swimming along the bottom, following the mountains, following, um, you know, like the canyons that are there. They're not following anything by sight. Uh, some scientists think that they have a, a type of honing, an electromagnetic sense possibly, that tells them which way to go, like sea turtles or birds or sharks, but we don't know. We don't find the same organs in humpback whales as we find in sharks and sea turtles and birds. Those organs tell those other animals where to go. But humpbacks don't have the same kind of mechanism, so scientists don't know right now how they know where they're going. The only thing that we do know is that they find their way there. They find their way there and back again every year. Another piece of this puzzle that we do know is that whales, many, many whales, and humpback whales especially, are very vocal. So they talk to each other. They sing at certain times of the year, and they also make a series of clicking noises, guttural grunts, they blow bubbles, and that might be a way that they lead one another and convey information about how to get down to their favorite breeding grounds in the winter. But we don't know. Okay, so I have a couple more questions for you guys. So now that we know, number one, where the whales call home, these whales call Alaska home and Hawaii home, and number two, we know what they need to survive. They need a good breeding ground and they need lots of food. What do we have to do as humans, as a big group of friends, to protect them? 
what are the things that we have to make sure we do on our end to make sure that they can feed in Hawaii and well feed in Alaska and then go to Hawaii to have their babies. How can we help them? Anybody have any ideas? Not pollute the oceans. Yes, yes. What else? Do not pollute. Don't pollute. Don't litter. Don't litter, yes. What about cleaning up after ourselves as, as fishermen? Do you think that fishing lines could hurt whales? Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Fishing lines can hurt whales. What about, you said not polluting. What about overfishing in Alaska? What happens if we overfish all of the favorite fishes that whales like to eat? What about that? Then they have nothing to eat. Exactly. It's simple, right? There are a few simple things that we can do to make sure that they stay happy and healthy and that we have friends and we can work together and live on this planet and share these spaces together. So we can make sure that they have enough fish. You guys said that. We can make sure that they have clean water. We can make sure the water is clear of hazards and fishing lines. We can make sure another thing is that we need to make sure the water isn't too noisy. If there are too many boats in the ocean, the water becomes so noisy that the whales can't communicate with one another. They can't hear one another. They can't talk back and forth and convey that vital information about how to get places, how to collaborate on feeding and catch more fish. So we gotta keep the oceans quiet. So there are two places that with UNCRUZ we visit where all of these needs are met. We go to Glacier Bay National Park where the rangers do just what all of you guys just talked about. They don't let people fish the same fish that the humpbacks eat. They keep the water clean. They limit the number of boats that come into the park so the water isn't noisy. And the water is free of fishing gear. And in the marine sanctuary in Hawaii, the rangers do the exact same thing. So at least we know that in those two places, the whales are well taken care of. Now, one place that we know of where they're not taken care of is when they're making that journey from Hawaii to Alaska and back again. The whales are out on their own in that space and they come into contact with lots of different hazards. So are you guys all gonna become good conservationists and help us start protecting the humpback whales? Yeah, I see lots of nodding heads. <laughs> Do you have a question about what we're talking about today? Leave your questions in the comments below and we will get right back to you. What happens if you use too much water? They could make, if you use up too much water, you could make, you can make the oceans have not enough water for the fish or the fish could die. That's true, that's very true. Um, one piece of that, one piece of that really good point is that we have the ability to change the water in the oceans. We've seen that. So there's a specific thing that scientists are studying right now called ocean acidification. And that's a fancy word for just what you're talking about. It's when the water changes and becomes too acidic for all sorts of critters to live in. We haven't seen that affect the whales directly, but it does affect them indirectly. So when the ocean becomes too acidic, the small teeny tiny critters that the whales eat, their lifestyles get interrupted and it hurts them. We see this with salmon too. Someone asked the question about salmon. Salmon, when they're really small little juveniles out at sea, they eat lots of different types of food. And those types of food are being affected by ocean acidification. This is tied to global warming and climate change. That's why it's extremely important to be good stewards of our environment and to take responsibility and to all pitch in and help and try and keep our planet clean and safe, not just for us, but for all the critters that depend on clean water, non-acidified water, clean air, open spaces. It's very important. That's a great question. What other questions have we got? So Jessica, Bianca has an interesting question that also makes me think of how when we were um, in Cape Cod, we went to a whale museum and it told us about how 
um, people used to hunt whales in order for us to have them to have fuel for their lambs and different applications. And then at some point of time, we stopped using whales and we started to use, um, you know, crude oil to yes. power everything. So now at this point of time, how are whales doing? Are there any endangered species of whales or are, they, are the populations coming back? So that's a great question. The humpback whale populations are coming back. We're seeing excellent rebound in their population. We're seeing excellent rebounds in some other populations as well, as well gray whales for one. Uh, we think that the sperm whales are doing quite well. However, there are several populations of whales that are endangered and are not doing well at all. And so there are lots and lots of different type of whales all over the globe and some are doing well and some aren't. And it's not due to whaling anymore necessarily because as you said, we switched to a different power source and we don't need whale oil in order to light lamps and do things like that uh, or for an energy source. But people, whales our, are endangered um, and not doing quite well because of entrapment in fishing gear, uh, because of pollution, because of loss of habitat, uh, because of loss of food sources. For example, the gray whales, the gray whales are a species that travel all the way from Mexico all the way up to Alaska and to the Arctic. They travel up the coastline though. They don't go out in the middle of the ocean where it might be safer. So they come into contact with lots of different human habitation and lots of their habitats, their places where they feed along the way, have been destroyed. They feed in shallow marine areas, really muddy areas. They dig their noses through the mud and they filter feed the small critters that live in the mud. A lot of those muddy estuaries have been drained to build houses and shopping malls and all sorts of things for human needs that didn't take into account that those whales need those places to feed in order to make their great migrations. So that's an example of one way that we're negatively affecting a species of whale. Uh, ocean toxicity is another way that whales are being negatively impacted from human behavior. So if we can keep our pollution out of the oceans, if we can keep our big industry out of the oceans, if we can limit our oil spills in the oceans, then we help all the whales. Okay, so there are two questions. One is um, whether blue whales are endangered, and the other question is how can one oil spill affect the whale population? Um, I don't remember whether blue whales are taken off the list yet or not. I was just in Baja in the Sea of Cortez where we saw all the big beautiful blue whales. They're the largest whale on the planet and they're the largest animal to ever live. So think about all the dinosaurs guys. Think about how big dinosaurs are or were. Blue whales are larger than any dinosaur that ever lived. They're incredible creatures. Uh, and they live lots of different places, but one place where we get to see them on the trips that I go on is in the Sea of Cortez. And they're there with their calves and they're feeding. They're incredible, beautiful, beautiful sights to see. But let's see, what, how does an oil spill affect a whale? All right, so has anyone seen salad dressing? Yes, right? We've all seen salad dressing. You know how the oil in salad dressing sits on top of the water? Have you seen that? The separation? We've got this layer of oil on top of water below. That's because oil is lighter than water. So if you spill a bunch of oil into the ocean and it coats the surface of the top, how do you think that would affect whales? Yeah, go ahead. Who was it? Is it Lucia? It would, it would, it would become, it would become such a risk for the whales. It would for when they breathe, right? Yeah, they need to breathe because they have organs like us, but not exactly. Exactly. They have lungs just like you. They need to breathe air. They can't breathe seawater. They're mammals just like us. So if oil is sitting on the top, they have a very hard time breathing. 
Also, if oil is sitting on top of the water, it makes the water toxic and all of the fish end up accumulating oils in their bodies and not the good kind of oil, the toxic kind of oil that makes them poisonous. And then of course, how many pounds of fish every single day do the humpbacks have to eat? 5,000. So if you're eating 5,000 pounds of toxic fish a day, you're not gonna be that healthy, are you? No. Those are just a couple of ways that oil spills affect humpbacks. But the quick answer is that the oil infiltrates the entire food chain. So it doesn't just affect the humpbacks, it affects every single living thing in the ocean. Great questions.